Dr. Kathrada, welcome and many thanks for giving us your time this evening. Thank you for having me. One of the things that really many people will remember at the funeral of the late Nelson Mandela, you, you shared with the world a very personal moment of, of pain and loss. And I'm wondering how, almost two years later, you found, if at all, some kind of acceptance and peace with the loss of a, loss of a dear friend and a close comrade. No, that was one of the most difficult speeches for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, people, you know, it was uh, broadcast live all over the world. Yes. And uh, a few months ago when I was in America, and this still reminded me of that. But uh, it was a difficult speech. And whenever I, people talk about it, uh, it all comes back. So it's still something very, very difficult to get your, your head and your heart around. It, yeah. A close, it's close, a close friend. You spent more time with him on Robben Island than you would have had time to spend with him after your release. Was that difficult that, that you had da almost daily access to uh, Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, but obviously when he came out, you had your political work to do. He had the job of becoming the president of a democratic South Africa. Did you still find enough time to see each other and talk? Well, you know, uh, the five years of his term, mm -hmm. uh, there was this uh, fancy term, uh, parliamentary council in the office of president uh, or the advisor. Yes. So I was in the same office. I mean, I almost adjoining his office for the five years. Uh, we had constant contact, uh, but of course, he was a very busy man. Yes. And uh, during that period, uh, most of the time during working hours, it was just in connection with work. It, it's important, Dr. Kathrada, that um, in those first five years of the democracy, you, you were deployed to work at Parliament. And I wonder what your views are now about the levels of debate and the nature of political conversation that goes on in our parliament. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's changed a lot since 94. You know, I'm afraid I, I don't follow it very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the media, but uh, I must confess I sort of don't go out of my way to even listen to parliament uh, or those programs. Your foundation, the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation, is very much about getting South Africans to talk, um, uh, even if it's not in a forum like Parliament. And, and maybe you can tell us what the, what the foundation does and what you're hoping to achieve. Well, you know, the, the main, uh, the motto of the foundation is deepening non-racialism. Mm -hmm. So we try to reach out, particularly to young people, with that message. Uh, well, well, of course, we don't confine ourselves to young people. Yes. We try to reach out more and more to young people because we found in our experience that unfortunately the young people are not very conversant with even the more recent history. So that you have some outrageous statements that's recently being made that Mandela sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are under the impression that it was just a walkover. Yes. That MK was just waiting to overthrow the government and, and take power. That is the impression a lot of young people have got. And it's difficult to reach out and, 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 and change them, to change their uh, knowledge of, 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 of history. Tell us, let, let's go back to s some real basics, um, Dr. Kathrad, and, and, and ask you what non-racialism is in your view. I mean, you might throw the term out into a group of people and they might all interpret it slightly differently, but, but how do you understand it? Well, you know, I, I don't uh, go too much for definitions. Yes. Simply stated, all I grew up in the Young Communist League. All people are equal. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, as simple as that. Uh, so I always uh, avoid getting into academic discussions on non-racialism or anything. To me, it's just a simple thing. Uh, uh, what non-racialism, well, now, of course, there's more emphasis on anti-racialism. Yes. Yeah. 
086-00-0059. Our guest is former Ravonia trialist Dr. Ahmed Kathrada. He heads the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation and we're busy talking about its work. He's also on the ANC's Integrity Commission, uh, which we'll explore a little bit later in the show. But we'd love to hear from you. Call in, give us your questions, give us your thoughts. 86 369 If you'd like to send us a text message, we're on Twitter, both myself, at John Pillman, and also the Foundation, at Kathrada Found, and you can go to the Today with John Pillman Facebook page and post your comments there. Dr. Kathrada, when, when we talk about race on this radio show, and obviously, as you can imagine, it comes up a topic a great deal. There are some people who feel that the ideology of non-racialism perhaps is used as a way of covering up some of the continued racial division and racial inequality in, in the country. I'm sure you get that, uh, confronted with that in your work at the foundation. What, what's you your know, answer for, to that? Fortunately, we haven't come across all this academic debates. Yes. Uh, a, a little bit comes off in the, in the Mandela Foundation, uh, but not in our foundation. These academic debates uh, hardly ever come, come up. When, when, we, when, when you have just accepted the, the, the men in the street understanding of, uh, of what, they, what, we, what they mean and what we mean by non-racialism. Is there, is there not, though, a little bit of pushback against the idea of non-racialism amongst young people who feel that this is still a profoundly unequal society based on racial lines? Yes, well, that is a very disturbing thing. Mm-hmm particularly the uh, young people's uh, demonstrations. I, I, I don't for a moment condemn them or criticize them. At the same time, of course, we, de- raise, we, we do wish that uh, they were more knowledgeable mm-hmm. uh, about not only the past, but the present even, what, what they are facing. Uh, but uh, without the knowledge of the past, they're not going to understand the, future, uh, the present even. Uh, as they should understand it. Let's talk about an issue, uh, Dr. Kathra, that's been in the news in the present, the Integrity Commission of the ANC. It's a structure that you've been asked to contribute to and, and, and work with. Tell us about its work and where you think you're having success and perhaps where you're not biting as but hard was, as uh, you'd like. I was uh, put onto it, but I, I didn't accept the position. Okay. Well, well, why not? Well, you know, I thought in simple terms, who am I to sit on an integrity commit commission and what gives me the right to, to, to judge other people's integrity? Simple as that. And I thought, well, I'm not in a position to do that. Is that a personal choice? Do, do you nevertheless accept that, that there has to be some kind of structure within the party to deal with the kind of corruption that I'm sure you must be aware of and that seems to be causing the party some significant political damage. Oh yes, that's, that's a, a very big issue nowadays and it's increasing unfortunately. So uh, I welcome, you know, this is a marches by Wavi for instance, mm-hmm. anti-corruption and uh, there are other people involved in, in, in the same thing. This, I think, what is his name? Lewis, is it? Mm-hmm. Dave Lewis running Corruption Watch, yes. Yeah. So all of them are doing good work, uh, but it needs a lot more of mass work. Yes. Uh, I'm not for a moment saying that uh, uh, work among smaller groups is not necessary. It is. But there has to be much more mass work. So... um Osborne was just saying that, that uh, you have many, many poor, ordinary people, but politicians seem to have done generally very, very well. Do you think we've rewarded our politicians materially too much? Do, do we pay them too much? Do we allow them too much access to business and the economy? Well, I'm afraid I'm not going to comment on that. Mm-hmm. I'm not in a position to. I am just a rank and file member of the ANC in mm-hmm. my branch. Mm-hmm. No more than that. So... Uh, and uh, as far as the activities go, I get invited uh, yes. by branches and so forth, ANC branches, and so way to Bloomfield, etc. But that's my activity. Uh, what happens higher up? I mean, I follow in the media, mm-hmm. and I, I'm not in a position to comment really with the with the little knowledge that I have.
<laughs> the, the other point that Osborne was raising, he expresses concern that political prisoners from other um, uh, political parties, uh, the PAC notably he mentions, weren't released as quickly and as promptly as they should be. Was that an issue amongst yourselves as political prisoners at the time that you wanted to make sure that the amnesties were given to everybody and everyone equally? You know, again, not, not speaking authoritatively, but my understanding was the actual uh, offences they were exp- uh, they committed, and uh, it, it's uh, I think, for instance, uh, the murder. Uh, the the I'm not condemning them. Yes. But uh, what is held against them is when they raided the church. Uh, uh, when they raided those uh, people, uh, when I say they, it was the PAC, and I'm not in a position to condemn or criticize them. Yes. But we read in the papers that they attacked the ordinary people picnicking at Bashi River. And those are the t- things that sort of one wishes didn't happen. 23 minutes past six. Let's go back to the lines. And Buto is calling from Boxburg. Hi, Buto. Uh, good evening, John, and uh, good evening to Dr. Katrada. Good evening. Good evening. Look, uh, Dr. Katrada, I'd love to find out what is your comment, because now you've been a man that has sacrificed his life for this new South Africa. And what is your comment about what you saw in 2012 when the Marigana massacre happened? live on television when people who were striking were shot down like not even dogs i don't know what kind of maybe rhinos when they were shot down like rhinos well thanks mbuto go ahead dr kathrada the killing of every human being even one human being is is hurtful but again i was not an americana I don't know under what circumstances the police uh, were, were called upon to use the live ammunition. So I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to comment authoritatively uh, about things that I just follow in the media. I'm not for a moment criticizing the media. The media does its best to cover, but obviously uh, the media itself has got limitations. So. Uh, I can't comment on Marikana. What I repeat is every life is important. And every killing is something that is that's of concern to, to people. Did, did you, though, without commenting on the specifics of, of what may, may or may not have happened there, Dr. Kathrada, you, you must have felt a deep sadness as somebody who came out of prison after a long time there in the belief that those things were going to be in our past. That was very much a feature of apartheid South Africa where protesters got shot and killed. There must have been a part of you that wondered how that could happen under our democracy. Yes, well, one wishes when we see these uh, activities and the reaction of the police. Now, again, I'm not an expert on, on policing, but one wishes. Are there no other ways in which the police can deal, particularly with crowds. We, as uh, laypersons, we see or we've heard of water cannons. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are there no other means? Now, I'm not condemning the police. Are there no means uh, other than live ammunition uh, or other forms of violence to bring, where necessary, where bring crowds under control? But one can just express a wish that these things don't happen. Dr. Kathrada, you've been out of jail now for 26 years. You were in jail for 26 years. What have been the most difficult things, just on a personal level, what were the hardest things to get used to when you were released from prison? Obviously, South Africa in the early 60s and South Africa in the late 80s were very different kinds of places. What what did you find hardest to adjust to? Well, it... Well, on the on the night, on the eve of our release, yes, when the head of the prison came and said, "I have just received a fax from Pretoria headquarters 
you're going to be released tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Now, instead of the jubilation and the dance, the question was, what is the facts? <laughs> you, well, nev- you, you had never received or heard of faxes before. We saw this animal when they had television. Yes. But you can't conceptualize faxes and these things uh, just by looking at the television. Uh, it's only when we came in out and actually saw what faxes are and how they work. But same thing applies to so many things. Uh, technology mm-hmm. had passed us by. We, computers, the last computer I had seen before going to jail was that huge one on display at OK yes. That's Almost the size of a prison cell. Right. And then you come out and see these little things. Then you come out and see something called ATMs and all kinds of... I still don't know how to work an ATM. Uh, because you go to one, you think you've mastered it, you go to the other one, it's different. Yes. So fortunately, I send my little niece to, to, to do all these ATMs and things. I, I don't touch those. On, on the subject of children, I, I'm reading here from a transcript of an interview you gave with Al Jazeera, and I, and I want to share this with people because... I, I think it's important we talk about it. Um, the question asked of you was, what was it like when you finally got off the island? And you make a number of points. But then you say this. In terms of deprivation, the worst deprivation was the lack of children on Robben Island. I saw and touch, saw a child and touched a child after 20 years. It was the worst deprivation. Absence of children. Tell us a bit more about that. Because when people think of prison, I think they think of confinement, poor food, uh, bad treatment, but that's not something that many people uh, would, that would, they would think about that. And, 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 and tell us why you highlighted that. Because it's a, a natural society. Yes. You see white adult males in uniform, black adult males in uniform. At visits, you see adults, you don't see children. Now, I must be uh, quite clear because people who are married and had children, when they reach a sort of A group in prison, they could have visits from their wives and their children could come. Yes. I was not married. So I felt that deprivation very much more. Uh, t- so much so that at times you even want to hear the cry of a child. Yes. Uh, and when I s- saw and touched a child for the first time, it was not at uh, on Robben Island. It, you know, after 18 years, five of us with Mediba and Walter Sassoul and others were transferred to Posmo Prison where things were relaxed, much more relaxed because we were only five. Yes. And when my lawyer... Uh, Wesson came to see me. He came with a little girl who refused to stay in the car. Mm-hmm. And the warders uh, relaxed. And they said, let her, let her come in. Now, that was the first time after 20 years she sat on my lap. Mm-hmm. There was no legal consultation because it was just an overwhelming experience just to see this child touch her. And I, sp- I couldn't speak to her father the lawyer, mm. he had to come back to see me because my concentration and that half an hour or three quarters of an hour, I was just overwhelmed and stroked her hair and tried to talk to her. And uh, as I say, I repeat, there was no legal consultation at that particular yeah. occasion. So one tries to, even now, I try to make up for that deprivation. I had occasion to take 20 or 30 children to Robben Island, which I do almost as a tourist guide. And again, it was such a wonderful thing for me. On the other side, about two or three weeks ago, I told vet, I took out veterans. Mm -hmm. Among them was a lady of 105. Goodness. So it was the other side of things. But she coming back to children. That was the main deprivation. Food, you're deprived of uh, the nice food, etc., etc. But you get used to all that. You adjust to that. 
you can never just to the absence of children was that part um dr kathrada of what of what underpinned nelson mandela's constant public engagement with children even even in informal moments where there wasn't a tv camera in sight he would always head for a group of children and engage with them with a a warmth as if he was their their bloodline grandfather was was that in part a reflection of that painful absence that you describe i mean these are helpless human beings yes unable to do anything themselves so naturally the human reaction to that would be pity and want to protect them uh, so it was as as simple as that you want to protect the helpless those who are not protected and those the majority they all of them are children let's go back to the lines 0860009593695 for your text messages tam sanka is calling from fosleris good evening to you Good evening, John, and good evening to the Dr. Kadrada. Good evening. Uh, I've got, a, I've got a, a few questions for Kadrada. Uh, firstly, uh, according to you, Dr. Kadrada, um, is it when you look South Africa, is it what you fought for? Uh, number two, why do we still have um, uh, two education system, private and and public? Number three, why do we still have um, the two uh, health systems? Uh, private and 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 public and number three lastly yes. why do we still have those prisoners who are political prisoners because they are full, they are for other political organizations and they are not uh, uh, freed and then secondly that we as people who are in 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 the struggle we don't benefit it's only those people who are um uh, um let me say in case okay outside Ta- Tam Tam San Kai thanks I think the last question was dealt with it was asked earlier by Osborne but uh, first question when you look at South Africa now do you feel this is you see the fruits of what you fought for or are there shortfalls that 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 the trouble you No I'm always conscious of the fact we are only 20 years as a democracy in the 20 years we can't deal with the 300 years of apartheid operation 20 years in the life of an individual maybe a lot yes not in the life of a nation i mean i've had the privilege of traveling a little uh, i've been to india i've been to some of the countries uh, in africa who's had their independence much earlier than we have uh, and one sees that it's not easy just to deal with problems that come that you inherit over years and years so i'm not in a position to criticize i i repeat 20 years in the life of a nation is not much but i think that our country has made substantial progress uh in even in dealing with poverty old age grants etc uh, clinics uh, education i think i think i'm correct in saying that every child is still at school is is already at school Uh, uh i i see that uh, water electricity uh, almost all the, the, the majority of population have got that which they didn't have before i can my mind always goes back to what was then all on the west yes and i used to is f- frequently go to madiba's house walter sasulu's house dumnoque's house they had to go outside to the tap water tap outside there uh, in the little area in uh Uh, just uh, under the fence so those are things that we have experienced but now again statistics statistics tell us that water and electricity is now provided to the majority of the people of this country and i haven't seen anybody disputing that do you have a view on 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 the other questions that tom sanko raised uh, that that a country like ours shouldn't have a separation of private education and health on the one hand public education and health on the other there should be one system and it should be equitable do you have a thought on that no i can't i, I really can't comment uh I, i would wish a position would be different but i can't criticize or comment on that i wish there would be complete equality but uh, i don't know enough uh, to comment on that 
you 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 clearly keen uh, not keen Dr. Kathrada to comment in a in a critical way but but do you often encounter that kind of um I guess unhappiness from South Africans who feel that we haven't done as much as we should in 20 years um a lot of the advantages have gone to people who are politically connected and so on I mean you, you you're certainly aware of that uh, that unhappiness out there I fully appreciate the impatience of people the wishes, the desires of people. Uh, I can't comment authoritatively, mm -hmm. but what I can say uh, from what I've seen and read about, and I repeat, 20 years in the life of a nation, you can't solve the problems of 350 years of oppression. 20 years. And again, I repeat my experience of India. I've been to India several times. Mm -hmm. India was also an oppressed country. They got their independence in 1947. And they are still grappling. There's massive poverty. There's hunger. There's crime. There's all kinds of problems. Mm. So you can't just wish these things away uh, by, a, by a magic wand. Uh, when you fish, uh, conf uh, confronted with reality, it's quite a different thing. I know the person in the street and we have the fullest uh, sympathy with them and understanding but on the other hand I, ca I can't criticize the government I don't know uh, what challenges they are facing what the resources are to face the challenges so one could wish that all the uh, things that people are complaining about one could wish they were not there but when it comes to reality I can't speak uh, 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 whether the government has done enough or not. I myself, as a personal experience, mm. and from what I read and experience, I think that the government has made substantial progress in education, in health, and so forth. It may not be enough, of course, the challenges are still here. Challenges of hunger, poverty, still here. But I, I, I hate to be repeating myself, we are yes. only 20 years old. Dr. Kathrada, going way back, you, you grew up in a very small town, now part of Northwest Province, then in the Western Transvaal, Schweizer Renica. Do you think any part of your political personality or who you are was shaped by the fact that you had a small town background? It, it affected me in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> before the Group Areas Act, there was, of course, segregation, segregatory laws. So, I grew up in a house. The immediate left neighbor was a bank manager, white. Mm -hmm. Behind our house was the mayor, white. So, as children, and then, of course, because uh, in Swazarenica, there was an African school, I was not admitted. Mm. There was a white school. I was not admitted. The Indian community was very small. There was no school. But my father arranged for the principal of the African school, M Mr. David and Charlie, who used to come home in the afternoons to teach me the ABCs. So eventually, at the age of eight, when I had to be sent to Johannesburg, 200 miles away, to school, <coughs> within a year, I could get into Standard 1, hmm. thanks to Mr. Machali. So I managed to reach matric at the same time as 17-year-olds could reach matric, again, thanks to Mr. Mr. Machali. And, but when I came to Johannesburg, I began to realize why at the age of eight had to, I to be wrenched away from my mother and father mm. and not allowed to go to the school of, of my friends? Those are questions the youngster asks. Why? Why couldn't I go to the school? But it's only much later in life that you start a, a learning about apartheid. Did that plant the seeds of your A, political inquiry and B, the beginnings of your political conscientization? It could have an Im impact, but, you know, at that age, one doesn't think much. Yes. 
in the area where I grew up in Fortsburg, there was a, a, a club run by the Young Communist League. Now youngsters like films, they like picnics and so forth. So through the that uh, club, I joined the Young Communist League at the age of about 12, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, it just went, it went on and on. Have you been back to Schweizer Renneken? And if you have, what was it like? No, I go regularly, at least once a year. My youngest uh, sibling mm-hmm. is still there and his children and some of my nephews. So at least once a year, uh, we have a, a gathering there uh, in Schweizer Renneken. And then we have another gathering in Johannesburg, a family gathering. Speaking of going back, I mean, one of the things you've done and, and, and you shared with me a, a book of people you've taken to Robben Island and, and, and shared your experiences there and, and some of the lessons learned. Each time you go back there, is it is it always with a sense of ease or is there still a part of you that perhaps has any kind of anxiety, fear about returning to the, the place of your imprisonment? No, my very first uh, return to Robin Island after I was released was with a French uh, television journalist. Mm-hmm. It was a traumatic experience because you see this little cell and we were on Robin Island for <coughs> sorry, 18 years mm-hmm. before five of us with Mediba were transferred. And you try to think now, by this time you're used to ha- a bigger houses or Halls. Yes. And then you try to think, how did I spend 18 years of my life in that little place, in that little cell where you stretch out your two hands and you touch the two walls almost. And Madiba's hands that fit much longer. Yes, yes. So that when he slept on the floor, you know, for 14 years we didn't have beds. So when Madiba used to lie down on the mat, his head almost touched uh, the wall. Mm. So you try to think now, how did I survive that? But then human beings are just. Human beings are just to all sorts of conditions. You, there are deprivations. There are also other uh, things that, that can break your, uh, your, your, your will. There are things, you know, that in prison, because in prison, I mean, no prison exists without bribery. Yes. So you could bribe, which we avoided, of course. Uh, but the, the deprivation is what you feel. But worse than that, the worst thing is for our, my exam, there were eight of us sentenced to life imprisonment. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Dennis, Go- Dennis Goldberg, being white, was not on Robin Island, so he was in Pretoria. I land on Robin Island at the age of 34, among the seven of us, I'm the youngest of the seven, I'm the only Indian. The first thing we had to do is to change into clothes, prison clothes. Governor Beg- Mbeki, 20 years my senior. Walter Sasulu, 18 years my senior. And Walter Sasulu I regarded as my father. Before, <coughs> before jail, during jail and after jail, yes. as my father. Because my father died at the age of 43. I could take to Walter my most private concerns. When he died, I asked the question, who do I turn to? I turned to Madiba. When Madiba died, you may have heard my speech. Yes. I had nobody to, to turn to. So those are deprivations that I felt in my adult life. Uh, out of prison. You you talk about Walter Sisulu and, and one of our listeners, Kingsley, um, Dr. Kathrada, asked a question about another um, person from that era. And he says, what do you think the youth of today should know about Bram Fisher, advocate Bram Fisher, and his role in the struggle against apartheid? Some thoughts on uh, Bram Fisher, who I'm sure you knew? I'm, I'm busy right at the moment writing about Bram Fisher. Mm-hmm. Not, not a, a big book or anything. I've been asked to write a chapter. Bram Fisher was a unique human being. And one can't talk about Bram Fisher without Molly Fisher. Uh, I talk of Bram and Molly as three couples Mm -hmm. whom I knew personally. 
whose marriages were made in heaven, Bram Fisher and Molly were with them. I had the closest contact with them before I went to prison, in prison. And there was a period, uh, you know, in those years, there was the 90-day act, uh, detention act. Yes. And I, I could smuggle letters. But when he came to a waiting trial period, Bram Fisher, he was one of the most senior advocates in the country. He was such a human being. He was always concerned about our welfare. Now here the country is one of the top leaders in the country. Used to take on my letter. I was involved with a, a white lady uh, under the Immolatory Act that was not allowed. Yes. But they knew her because she was in the movement herself. Brown used to take my letters to, uh, to her. Well, Brown gave it to Molly and Molly sent me a, a message that the son who had just acquired a bicycle he loves delivering my messages to and fro. Hmm. So what I'm coming back to is a small thing. But here's one of the QCs, senior counsel in South Africa, also highly respected in London, the only political prisoner who was given bail to go and fight a case in London. Hmm. That was Brown Fisher. But a down-to-earth human being. But so simple. When there was one occasion for, of many, when Molly was going to China and the Soviet Union and so forth on a visit, all he had to do is to phone me. My flight was about four or five blocks away. Yes. Not from. He came to my place. Uh, can you get the ANC for credentials for Molly? Now, that was Brahm, you know. Then, I can't finish Brahm about where he lived and the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Now, there were no swimming pools in Soweto or in any of the areas of Forsberg. And I used to sometimes go and spend weekends there, especially Saturday and Sunday. You had literally combis full of people from Soweto, from Forsberg, coming to swim there. Molly Fisher constantly smiling hmm. we'll give them tea coffee biscuits and and I'm not talking of two three individuals kumbi loads used to come there and I used to witness that but uh, and that was wrong <laughs> when we were sentenced you know he was our lawyer yes yes I had the most uh, chance of getting off on a, on appeal politically Brahm agreed with us that we should not have been. Politically, I'm, I mean uh, leg legally, but politically, he, uh, rather the other way around. Yes. As a lawyer, even after we were sentenced, he came to see us on. <clears throat> now, what we didn't notice when he came to see us is the hat he was wearing. Mm -hmm. We had that consultation and then the the uh, colonel colonel Fusser mm -hmm. came to give us the message that Molly Fisher died in an accident Brown wouldn't tell us because he did not want to disturb our thinking our emotions by telling us that Molly is dead he wanted to have a proper legal consultation and then only relay the message to us Extraordinary stories, and unfortunately, we don't have time for any more. But many thanks to uh, Dr. Ahmed Kathrada joining us here on Kai FM, and we'll obviously keep up with the work of the Kathrada Foundation. Thanks for giving us your time on 95.9. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to you and to the listeners, and thank you for the patience.